Good morning, ladies. Welcome to your week on creating a content calendar. Um, I listened to Maria's uh, week last week about branding and I loved it. I need to make a logo myself. I have somewhat of one, but not a great one. Um, and so I definitely need to work on that visual side of my branding. So I'm going to be, I've been taking notes and I'm going to be doing something with what she suggested. Um, and work on that. Um, but what I did notice was there was a lot of overlap between what Maria talked about with getting, um, understanding your brand messaging um, and your audience and so on with the way that we work on planning your content. A lot of these things you also need to know to understand how to plan your content co correctly, or at least not correctly, but easily in a way that makes it easy for you to set up a calendar and gets you to your goal of where you want to be. So what I'm going to work on this week is helping you create a content calendar. The actual part where you create the calendar will probably happen on Friday. Um, it's quite a small part of the process, but what you really need to do is understand a lot of earlier parts to help you to get there. Um, and the good news is that once you've understood those earlier parts, each week or month or quarter or however often you plan your content out um, will always be easier because you've made your big goals. You may want to adjust those over time, um, but once you have an understanding using this framework of how to do that, then it should make it much easier for you to fill in a content calendar. You're still going to have to do the work of creating the content. So there's unfortunately a limited amount that we can do about getting around that unless you are at the le level in your business when you are ready to hire a content creator for you. Um, but assuming that you're working on your own content or even if you are um, farming out some parts of that process, all of that will become much easier. You'll know what you're trying to say and what the goal is if you've worked through this framework with me this week. So a little bit about me first. My name is Gillian Hill and I run Jill Hill Writing Services um, and I have a separate business, Jill Hill Edits. They are somewhat amalgamated. Um, my branding could probably do with being a little more clear on what the difference is, but at the moment I'm running those both on Facebook and on Instagram as somewhat as the same um, business. And that is causing some interesting issues for me as I create my content. So I may use some examples of that um, for you. I'm in the process of separating those out, trying to create better identities for them. So I may have some personal examples for you as we go through this. Um, I am a copywriter and an editor. So I started out as, um, I actually started out as a corporate attorney in Scotland, as you can maybe tell by the accent, um, over 10 years ago. And then when my husband and I moved to the States, we had to get green cards. We had to, we moved states three different times. We had kids, all the usual things that happen when you're in your 30s and um, then by the time I was ready to start working again, I didn't really want to sit at the bar. I didn't want to do that job with all those hours. And I realized that I wanted to work for myself and create my own business with the hours that worked for me. Um, and someone said, I was already a fiction writer. So someone suggested to me that I do some editing on their work. And I discovered that I loved editing. I love the, um, I think it's a thing that, um, I can understand as an attorney. I really love seeing the big picture, trying to understand what the large point is and make sure the flow of the structure works. And I really love the nitty gritty and getting in and making sure that all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, but making sure that the flow works. So if you've used um, capitalization on a word somewhere, let's make sure it's the same when, when it gets picked up three paragraphs later. Um, so I think my attorney brain was pretty well suited to that level of editing, um, the big and the small um, and everything in between. So I loved that and I got into editing, which is why my kind of first business was Jill Hill Edits. Um, and then as I moved along where people were asking me to do some of the writing for them, which I also love. Um, so I write blog posts and articles for businesses, but I also write people's websites and landing pages and I got into conversion copywriting as well, um, which is when I set up a separate um, business name for that with Jill Hill Writing Services. Um, so I love uh, when I think about how to create content, I'm often thinking about it from the editing side of you as well as from just pure creation and also that big picture, small picture, get the detail right. Um, so today, what I wanted to talk about um, at the beginning was our audience um, and who you are writing for. Maria mentioned this a little bit in her um, sessions last week in her expert area, um, and I really loved everything she had to say applies equally well to figuring out your content. So if you have been working on your ideal client 
avatar, your I call it your ideal client or your ideal customer. There's lots of different ways of describing that, but really narrowing down who it is that you want to work for. Um, so I would strongly suggest that you go and read the post that Maria put up about that last week if you haven't already, because she will show you how it applies visually to your branding, but it's really very much the same high level um, understanding um, that applies when you're doing your content. Um, so what I wanted to do was move it just on a little bit to help you think about your, your ideal client in a new way. Um, I'm sure lots of you have been hearing about and some of you may have funnels. Funnels seems to be the new watchword. Um, but a funnel has been in existence for as long as people have been trying to sell or trade or barter their things, try and persuade you to buy something from them or trade something from them. Um, and a funnel is really just the process, the journey from taking uh, anyone who sees your um, content and what you talk about or what you visually show about what you're selling um, until the point where they become a customer and they buy from you and arguably and continue on. So they continue to be fans, they may buy again from you, they recommend you to other people. So I sometimes think about a funnel, but on its side, because it goes like this. Um, and I think about it more as a journey um, or a map, and it's a variety of destinations along the way. But one of the things that's always kind of um, bothered me about funnels is that it feels very one-sided. It feels like it's just about the business trying to get as many people as they can to fall into this kind of trap of a funnel and down you go and then you've bought from us. Now, and that's what the, not what it means, but particularly if businesses are a little more... Um, maybe not quite so obvious in their marketing tactics. I'm trying to be a little cheeky. Um, it can sometimes feel like it's just about them. It's just about how can I get as many people buying from me as possible? Um, and I don't think that's particularly what funnels are designed for. They certainly it doesn't have to be. That would be one interpretation of it. But I think generally it's not what it's designed for. Um, and so it doesn't have to feel that way when you're doing a funnel. And it doesn't have to be complicated. There are a lot of technologies now that allow many of us to create our own funnels and that's a great thing and you can use many of the complicated tools and spend lots of money every month um, and if you're at a certain stage of your business that may well make sense to allow you to get even more sales but um, the funnel is merely the process of moving someone along and um, the tools are where you get into the, the systems that you use to do that and a funnel in itself as the framework can be as easy as posting on your social media, um, which refers to a blog post that you wrote. Um, the person who's interested in what you wrote, because it has to interest them, clicks onto the blog post, reads more, it engages them more within the blog post. There are internal links to other places on your website. They read more about you again. They maybe read more about you. Sometimes it often has to be more than one touch. So they may not do this directly from the first time they find you on social media, but they um, they experience more of what you say, they like what you have to say, and through one of your pieces of content usually uh, is channeled to your website in some way by your blog post, for example, is already hosted on your website. Or if you don't, you're not using that, it could even just be if you don't have a website and you're just doing this through Facebook, it could be getting directly onto Facebook Messenger with them and giving them a phone number and email address to get in touch or asking for their, theirs and then moving into a more direct relationship and then agreeing a sale. So that's as easy as a funnel can be if you want it. But when I was saying I don't really like the idea is because it feels very one sided to the um, seller. It's all about what the seller wants and what the seller gets. Um, I much prefer to think of um, a sale with a buyer and a purchaser as a relationship. Um, and it has to work for both parties and it has to be balanced. So the, so the seller gets what they want out of it, which is selling more products. But the buyer needs to get something that they want out of it as well, which is the product or the service that is right for them and that works for them. Um, and I think it's very important to identify your ideal audience because not everybody is your ideal audience. So I'm a copywriter, but not everybody who needs a copywriter needs my services. Um, there are certain audiences that I appeal to more. There are certain ways of working that I have that work with um, 
a client better um, than they would for other copywriters. So it's why, for example, I'm delighted to see there's lots of copywriters that have joined this group because we all have a slightly different way of working. Uh, we have different areas of specialism that we focus on or we're generalists. Um, we have different kind of clients we've worked for in the past. We have different ways of working and approaches. Um, and all of that means that there may be two or three of us that will fit for you if you're looking for someone to do a job. But we will not all be able to do all the jobs um, that might be put forward in a, a platform like this and in a private group like this. Um, so you have a really important to identify who your ideal client is because it is not everybody who needs the service or product that you create. Um, so instead of a funnel, I like to think of uh, like panning for gold or precious stones um, and that idea of sifting and sieving. Um, so when someone is panning for gold or minerals, they're all, they wash out in the water from the river. So they, first of all, they have to be in a river they think is quite likely to include, let's say, it's gold for the purposes of this chat. They, um, they're, they're quite certain this is a place where they're more likely than other rivers to find gold. So they've already started to narrow down. This is probably the right place. Then they have maybe identified a particular part of the river that makes sense to them where they think they're even more likely to find gold. This is not something I know enough about to describe in great detail, but my understanding is there may be certain areas where the where the pockets of gold may lie. And that may be obvious due to the geology around, due to the turns in the river and so on. So they'll find a space that they think is um, narrows down again. If you think about a funnel and focus, narrowing down again, we're more likely to find your ideal client or your gold in this spot. Then, however, they take all of the product that's in the river which would be all the people who would experience their content and they sift it and they sieve it and the lots of the dirt and the sand that's small will fall through. That is not, that is um, an audience that sees it, but it's not your ideal client. So you have determined through your content what, who you are and what you represent. And that would be the size of the holes in the sieve and um, the audience that is not a good fit for that will fall through. Um, and my other understanding about gold panning, which is a little bit technical, is that because the gold is heavier than the rest, as you shake it, the gold gravitates into the middle. Um, and so after you've got rid of a lot of the high level stuff that you don't need, you're then left with things that are the right size. And then you do this certain swirling motion and the gold will move into the middle because it's heavier and the other pieces will stay around the outside. And at that point, you then hand pick out the gold as you spot it from the middle. Um, and so my feeling is that you want audience and people to be sifted out of your content. You want someone to look at it and say, no, that's not, nah, I don't, that doesn't um, resonate with me. I don't really think that I would like them as a copywriter or designer or whatever their service is. Um, not because you are bad at what you do, but because it doesn't resonate with them. Because the, the size of the holes that you have placed in your sieve mean that they fall through that. Um, and so you are then left with a, with a smaller part of your audience, which you feel like are an ideal, closer to an ideal fit for you. Then you do the next level where the real ideal client gravitates even further into the middle. So there are then other people around the outside. They may be people who you still do work for, but they're not really your ideal client. They're not exactly who you're talking to. And if they asked you to help with services, you may well, um, or products, buy products from you, you may well sell to them, um, but they're not who you're focusing on as your ideal client. Um, and then finally, picking pieces out by hand, I would argue is a little similar to getting finally getting down to sales calls or having someone on um, your products page on your website. You've reached the point where now there's a really high chance that that person is going to convert into a customer or a client. Um, there's still a chance that they won't, but by that point, the framework and the process that you have used should have knocked out quite a large number of people who, if you were to get them on a phone call um, or get them to your page, would just say, oh, actually, no, this is just not quite for me. Um, and something would happen that made it not a good fit and it wouldn't convert. Um, so for me, the process of creating content um, is as much about knocking out those people who are not your ideal client as including them in. You don't want your content to be for everyone because you are not for everyone for good reason. Um, you work with a certain perspective and a certain angle in what you do. 
um, and you work in a certain way and you produce certain types of results. As a writer, I write in a certain style. For example, I choose to do conversion copywriting. So that means that I will sometimes charge higher than other copywriters because I want to do a lot of research and digging and find voice of the customer. Um, and I, I'm fairly certain quite a lot of copywriters in here will do the same, but you can also find other copywriters who will just take what you have package it up and put it back out again and it will do okay for you and so if you don't want to spend as much money that may be a process you're willing to go through. Conversion copywriters will say no I want to spend more time and therefore more money uh, really researching what people who have the problem that your ideal client has um, and when you go and research that and you find things they've written on the internet because they all have in various places on Facebook on Amazon reviews and reddits and all kinds of places and forums about the particular problem they have um, you find the exact things they've said and then when you repurpose that and use it on a site where you're offering a solution if you've ever had that feeling when you read a website or a, a piece of content where you say oh, it feels like that was written for me then the chances are that a conversion copywriter has gone and read something that has been written by someone who has the exact same problem than you as you and they have found those words and they've used those words in their copywriting so I don't write how I feel about the problem or how I think you feel about the problem. I research how do people like you actually feel about the problem and then I use that wording in the in the um, copy. So um, yeah, there, I would not want someone who wanted the cheap quick fix and turn around, but there would be lots of people who would and that's a perfectly acceptable way to go. So that would be an example of where I would want to sift out by my talking about my um, work. I would want to sift a certain category of person out because they're not relevant for me. And I think that's a much fairer system that allows us to reach a point where someone buys from me. It's a more balanced relationship because they're getting what they actually want from a copywriter. I have provided enough content at various points that they've seen that lets them really understand who I am, what I do and how I work and how I can help them. Um, and the way that I would help them that would be different than the way that someone else would help them. Um, and so that's what's really important, I think, about your content. It's um, as much about um, turning the people who are not a good fit away as it is finding your ideal audience and talking to them. And really those are two sides of the same coin, but it's important not to forget that if you are getting really detailed and if you're really narrowing down on your ideal audience, by definition, there are people who are not your ideal audience who will be turned away or they may still read your content. They may still be happy to look at it, but they don't feel that tug that that's the person they want if they need your services or your products. So what I would really like you to do for today as the first uh, part of the exercise is to look at what you wrote when you did uh, Maria's process of defining who your ideal client is. If you haven't done that already, then make some notes on who it is that you really want to work for. Who's your dream client or customer? Um, when you picture um, if someone said, OK, there's a celebrity who you could get to buy your product or service and then they're going to talk about it to the world. Who is that? Like, what do they look like, sound like? What do they do? What's their um, impressions about things. Sometimes that can include quite a lot of personal stuff about their personality. It doesn't have to, it depends what you're selling. Um, but the other side of that coin is who do you not want to work with? Now, there's lots of easy things we can say there. We don't want to work with, I don't know, mansplainers. We don't want to work with, there's a variety of red flags that go up when you're looking at um, working with someone. Um, you don't want to work with someone who doesn't have a clear idea of what they want to do and so they're going to flip flop and change all the time, for example. Um, so there's lots of different things that we know as red flags that we don't want to work with, but I'm talking in a different sense that, than that. I'm talking about someone who would understand and appreciate that you do what you do, but it's just not a good fit for them. Um, so possibly, for example, if you sell a service, you would want to work with um, maybe not the very uh, corporate um, clients. Maybe you're looking for um, smaller businesses or maybe you're looking for um, kind of family-owned businesses um, where there's a more personal touch involved rather than it being more corporate. Um, in my fiction editing business um, I work with a wide variety of genres um, so but some people would say specialize in one genre over another um, and so if you did romance you may say I just I'm not willing to do sci-fi. I for example don't do a very heavy sci-fi um, not because I wouldn't, but because I don't really know enough about it because I don't do it. And so in reality, the kinds of editing um, 
when I when I put out content for my business about editing, I probably don't do stuff that involves that very high, heavy sci-fi side of things. And so someone who's reading that, if I'm giving examples from memoirs and romances and um, literature, they'd probably be kind of put off by that or it wouldn't resonate. It's maybe not that it would, they would be put off, it just wouldn't resonate with them in the same way. Um, I also like when I do editing to do uh, really detailed edits where I provide comments in the um, track changes so I don't just make a change I just say hmm this is not this doesn't sound quite right have you thought about this word or that word um, and they have to come up with their own idea of how to change it so I don't just fix it all um, some people just want they want to hand their manuscript over and not look at it again and they want someone to have it ready so they can then send it off to be um, published on Amazon Kindle direct publishing and I am not that kind of editor I want to have I want to you to make sure as an author that you really understand um why the changes are being made and, and be intentional about which word you pick so I don't want to pick the word for you because I feel because I'm not the writer and it may not fit with how you uh, wrote the wrote the art the manuscript so that would be an example where I would not be looking for that type of client, which is like, a, I'm done, thank goodness, hand it over to your editor and you're gone. Um, so by writing about that, by the back and forth that I have with clients when I'm editing and by discussing the fact that that's your responsibility as the author and you need to think with intent, there will be certain people that that wouldn't resonate with. And if they were looking for an editor and then they read some blog posts I'd written that talked about that, that would not make them want to pick me as an editor. And that's a good thing. They would That would be them sifted through my sieve um, and out. And But retained in that would be the authors who really do want to keep some level of control there and who do want to think about their word choice in great detail, individual words, um, every so often on different pages. Um, so I hope that helps uh, give you an idea of how to get started. Each day this week, I'm going to give you um, something to think about um to narrow down goals and like these are either you could see it as foundational pieces or or bigger picture stuff depending on whether you want to look at it from bottom up or top down um but by thursday and friday we're going to be getting right closer into the middle where we're going to get to the point where we're going to make a content calendar um and i shall provide a um a blank for you blank template to complete um, and ideally if you're all interested I would love to do that on a live where we all create it together um, and that way you could ask any questions as we go and um, we could do it in a live or we could do it in a zoom um, I think a live is probably easiest from the Facebook group point of view but I'm happy to consider other options but I would love if there could be people on with me where we create our calendars together and that way you could ask specific questions as you go because I think it's great to learn from what other people are doing as you are trying to experience it listening to examples of where people are getting stuck can sometimes really help so please uh, let me know if you are interested and what times you're available um, to do a live together on Friday where we could work through all this and meantime if you have any questions please drop them in the comments um, or send a message to me or put something directly into the group uh, and tag me in it and I'm happy to answer any questions you have and I look forward to the rest of the week with you all.